Welcome to Provisional Aspirations, a podcast exploring the psychology of religion, philosophy, and clinical mental health. I'm Jeffrey Wallace, author, religious trauma survivor, and graduate student pursuing a master's degree in counseling psychology. Join me as I indulge my academic interest in the human spiritual experience, a curiosity that I couldn't fully explore as a member of a high demand religious group. But now I'm learning out loud and it feels great. I've always felt that the study of psychology was a natural progression from my old obsession with religious theology. It seemed to me that religion, at the individual level, reduced to spirituality. That is to say that a worldview based on doctrine and theology was built upon something deeper and more central to the human experience. From there, it seemed to me that spirituality could be reduced to psychology, in that spirituality is a way of thinking, feeling, and behaving. This was definitely my frame of reference when I began my undergraduate studies in 2019, still as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, secretly learning the wisdom of the world that is foolishness with God, 1 Corinthians 3.19, as I tried to figure out how to navigate my life after releasing my belief in my community's shared religious philosophy. Soon, however, the question arose, where does psychology come from? I think this question is understandable in the religious or ex-religious thinker who's used to connecting psychic content with an outside source, like a higher power. That is to say, it's a bit of a flawed question to begin with, one that likely comes from being immersed in a society that still holds on to some religious notions. For example, it's hard not to concede that the religious concept of the soul, the God-given ghost-like quality that inhabits the body, did not lead to concepts such as personality and the self that have been enshrined again, even in the absence of religion, in the scientific domain. After all, why must our hopes, dreams, passions, and spiritual experiences have any grander meaning beyond what they objectively are, the side effects of electrical stimulation pulsing through the lump of fat in our skulls? The answer to the question, where does psychology come from, is the brain. Psychology reduces to neuroscience. Whatever theoretical assumptions that form the basis of psychology reduce to cognitive and affective experiences occurring in the brain and central nervous system. In recent decades, technology has allowed us to study the brain in new ways, which has led to the popularity of neuroscience. Philosophers, too, have realized that their intellectual inquiry leads inevitably to the brain. Classic questions upon which philosophers have deliberated for hundreds of years, like the nature of consciousness, the self, ethics, morals, truth, and the like, ought to be reducible to activity in the brain. The first to label this kind of cross-disciplinary inquiry was the Canadian philosopher Patricia Churchland, who coined the term neurophilosophy. I'm absolutely in love with Patricia Churchland's approach to scientific thought, and I'm currently reading her eponymous book, Neurophilosophy from 1986, as a way of getting to the historical root of this field of study. But I'm saving my further confessions as a sapio secret admirer for a later episode. This episode will serve as an introduction to neurophilosophy based on the book Neurophilosophy and the Healthy Mind by George Northoff. Northoff is a bit critical of Churchland, as I will discuss later in this episode. But I'm going to let that slide. I found Northoff's book easily digestible as an introduction to the field. It tackles some foundational concepts of philosophy from the perspective of neuroscience at the pop science reading level, with ample repetition of the main points, leaving the reader confident of their grasp of a handful of basic neurophilosophical ideas. Interestingly, as is indicated by the book's subtitle, Learning from the Unwell Brain, Northoff draws his philosophical conclusions from clinical patients. He discusses coma, vegetative states, schizophrenia, and depression as these have been studied at length in the search for medical treatments. So when discussing the nature of consciousness, the self, psychological disorder, etc., he analyzes research from brains that aren't functioning optimally and, based on the cognition that is lost or faulty in the clinical patient, makes assertions about the neurological mechanisms that contribute to philosophical content in healthy brains. In this episode, we'll talk about Northoff's discussion of the nature of consciousness, the self, and mental disorder, 
I'm saving discussion of emotion for a future podcast, after I finish some reading in Leonard Mlanidov and Yak Panksa that I'm in the middle of right now. I'm also really excited to cover Northoff's elaboration of neuroexistentialism, which marries a beloved psychotherapeutic modality and literary genre with the neuroscience of the brain. But I'll also have to leave that for another episode. Let's begin with the nature of consciousness. I won't introduce a lengthy discussion of the history of current theories regarding the nature of consciousness. Suffice to say that it's a well-debated topic, with much discussion surrounding what is called the hard problem of consciousness, which basically asks why some neurological mechanisms also come with a sense of experience, a rather ambiguous sensation of what it is like to be aware of cognitive processes. Northoff discusses this problem in his book. Most interestingly, though, he discusses how the resting state and intrinsic function of the brain can be connected to our experience of consciousness. He does this by analyzing the experience of patients in vegetative states. When an individual is in a vegetative state, their brain is still functioning at some level, but we say that they are unconscious. That is, they have no consciousness. Logically, then, by analyzing the difference between the activity of the unconscious brain in someone in a vegetative state and the activity of a normal brain, we should be able to determine which brain functions are absent in the unconscious person and thereby isolate the processes that are associated with consciousness. If you've done any reading in psychology, you're familiar with the concept of the unconscious mind. We understand that unconscious mental processing can impact our actions and decision making. Northoff talks about how traumatic early experiences can be encoded in our minds so that we are unconsciously, for example, avoiding putting ourselves in certain situations. But we're largely unaware of this unconscious mental activity because it doesn't contain the subjective processing of content that we associate with consciousness. It happens below the level of our awareness. Northoff clarifies, and I quote, the same content, whether a particular event, person, or object, can be present in both conscious mode with subjective experience and in an unconscious mode. The neuronal difference between the conscious and the unconscious mode must then be related to consciousness." End quote. In unconscious patients, intrinsic, resting state function does not completely cease. That's why doctors sometimes tell loved ones to talk to comatose patients. Even though the patient isn't consciously responsive, brain imaging shows that there is some brain response to such stimuli. So then there's something about the interaction between the intrinsic functioning, or resting state of the brain, and external stimuli that causes the emergence of consciousness. This approach challenges what was previously accepted about how consciousness emerges. What Northoff refers to as the extrinsic cognitive approach basically states that the brain is a blank slate until stimuli, in the form of sensory information, activates it. External stimuli enter the brain, it is then activated, and then somehow, a part of the unsolved hard problem of consciousness, leads to a conscious awareness of the stimuli. Northoff thinks this theory is incomplete because it fails to take into account the intrinsic resting state function of the unconscious brain. According to Northoff, and others before him, like the psychologist Carl Lashley, the intrinsic resting state function of the brain provides an organizational template from which consciousness arises. This organizational network includes neuronal networks like the default mode network in the midline region of the brain, the executive control network on the outer edges of the brain, and the salience network that assigns salience to external stimuli located in the sensory motor region of the brain. These areas, in that they create the organizational template of the intrinsic state, form a neuronal predisposition to consciousness. Consciousness occurs when external stimuli meet the level, form, and content required to stimulate the neuronal predispositions of the resting state. This leads to consciousness. To put it simply, Northoff says, and I quote, the neural predispositions will account for the necessary conditions of possible consciousness, and the neural correlates will reveal the necessary and sufficient conditions of actual consciousness. Phew. So why is this significant for research into the hard problem of consciousness? Northoff puts it this way, and I quote, The methodological starting point of philosophy 
is not only different here but reversed. Traditionally, in philosophy, we start with the mind and continue from there to the brain. Whereas now we start with the brain itself, its intrinsic activity, and extend from there to mental features such as consciousness. What is described as a metaphysical problem between two different existences and realities, mind and brain, is now converted into a transformation problem. How does intrinsic activity of the brain transform neuronal activity into mental features, end quote. I'm with Northoff in this perspective. Because of my history deconstructing cognitive illusions, like my religious worldview and mystical thinking, I'm completely comfortable de-emphasizing also the experience of consciousness. Why is it that we highly value consciousness? Why does it seem such a perplexing problem? The subjective experience of experience might be precious to us, because it makes us feel like people and alive. But from a neuroscientific perspective, it is no less valuable than any other sensory data. Doesn't our love affair with our own consciousness not also hail from the religious, superstitious, fantastical underpinnings of our scientific inquiry? Maybe this is the mystery at the root of spirituality. Let's move on to the identity of the self. Northoff digs deep into how the self can be investigated neuroscientifically. He first addresses the philosophical roots of belief and non-belief in the self, acknowledging that it has become an accepted modern perspective that the self is an illusion in consciousness. However, if the self is not of some neuro-philosophical significance, it ought to be processed the same as all other content in the brain. Northoff reminds us that several psychological studies have shown that self-related content is more heavily weighted in memory, emotion, and sensory motor response. This is referred to as self-reference effect. To test the impact of self-reference effect on the brain, Northoff states, and I quote, we can compare self and non-self specific stimuli in the scanner and investigate the underlying brain regions that respond. The results of these tests show that the brain areas involved in neural processing of self specific stimuli are areas of the middle of the brain, specifically the perigenual anterior cingulate cortex, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, the posterior cingulate cortex, and the precuneus. These are called cortical midline structures. Northoff admits, though, and I quote, how and why the specific physiological features of the cortical midline structures are transformed into mental features remain unclear, end quote. One very interesting finding in Northoff's research is that, and I quote, various investigators have demonstrated neural overlap between self-related processing and resting state activity levels, in that the former did not elicit changes in the latter. So despite the weight that self-related content is given in memory and emotion, this did not increase the activity in the intrinsic resting state areas that Northoff identifies with the neural predisposition of consciousness. He explains it this way, and I quote, You would think that the brain encodes high personal relevance items in commensurately high activity changes, so that the self-specific stimuli stand out when compared to non-self-specific ones and to the rest of the brain. That's the way you experience yourself. You stand out in the environment when compared to others. You would consequently expect your brain to do the same, to make the self stand out with high activity changes. That high activity change, though, does not seem to be the case. Rather, the opposite holds true. Yourself, the basic subjectivity of your experience and consciousness, does not seem to stand out at all. Rather, overlaps with your brain's ongoing resting state activity." End quote. Northoff explains the significance of this to philosophical inquiry. He states, What was long considered the pinnacle of the mind, self and subjectivity, seems now to be located at its very bottom, in the resting state activity of the brain. Self or subjectivity is an intrinsic ingredient of the brain itself and its intrinsic activity. Brain and intrinsic activity are, by default, subjective and cannot avoid constructing some kind of self. This is a radical thesis that reverberates deeply into neuroscience and its view of the seemingly purely objective brains, as well as into philosophy and its view of subjectivity as the province of higher mental states. Mm -hmm.
Northoff spends a few chapters on depression, anxiety, and schizophrenia in this volume. Again, the premise is that we can learn more about how the brain works and draw philosophical conclusions by analyzing what goes wrong in disordered states. His assumptions align with the commonly accepted biopsychosocial approach to mental unwellness, that mental disorder occurs when a combination of factors, biological, that is genetic or physiological, psychological, how an individual thinks, and social, the behavior and thinking of the other people in an individual's environment, interact and lead to mental distress. Northoff's approach also talks about three factors relating to mental unwellness, although he doesn't address genetic factors. He says that there's a triangulation in consciousness of self-related content, bodily-related content, and environmental content. These three elements would occur in reciprocal balance in a mentally well patient, but not so in an individual with mental disorder. You could imagine an equilateral triangle with self, body, and environment in each of the corners. That would be the case of a mentally well person, but an individual with mental disorder would be represented with some sort of irregular triangle. This would be the case of individuals with depression, anxiety, and the like. As we already discussed, Northoff finds the self in the medial regions of the brain. Other studies suggest that environment, namely non-self-related content of the brain, occurs in the lateral regions. And when imaging studies are made of depressed individuals, there is hyperactivity in the midline region, that is, the self-region. This tracks with what we know about some of the cognitive correlates of depression, as they relate to self-focus rather than environmental focus. One example is rumination, repeating thoughts over and over about some self-related problem or concern. Even in the resting state, the brain of an individual who is depressed shows more activity in the midline regions. However, Northoff admits, and I quote, that more findings are necessary to support the assumption that the neuronal resting state balance corresponds to the phenomenal balance between self and environment in lived experience. In short, we need to investigate the relationship between neuronal and phenomenal balances, end quote. So we can't say with certainty that the philosophical stance that mental distress results from an imbalance in self-focus and environmental focus is proven with the images of midline and lateral regions of the brain lighting up on an fMRI. Northoff also discusses schizophrenia, a situation that continues to puzzle the medical and therapeutic community because it seems to blur the lines between biological disease and cognitive disorder. He again talks about the relationship between self and environment and addresses the issue of social differentiation. He says, and I quote, the patients withdraw and disconnect or differentiate, i.e. they no longer receive signals from their social environment, which in turn lets them focus on their inward mental life with no external validation. This leads to an extreme imbalance between internal and external mental contents. The internal contents predominate completely, taking over in such a way that they, quote, develop a life of their own, end quote. One insight that I found particularly enlightening from Northoff's research about schizophrenia relates to the temporal abnormalities in midline brain structures of individuals diagnosed with schizophrenia, temporal meaning time-related. These time-related abnormalities may cause some difficulty relating environmental stimuli with self-related cognitive content. Northoff puts it this way, and I quote, Low-frequency fluctuations show extremely long cycle durations. These long cycle durations link and integrate different stimuli and events that, in healthy people, are usually processed in a segregated way. Is this the mechanism that allows the patient with schizophrenia to link events that are disconnected in the real world, such as the shaking of his or her head and the bending of the tree by the wind? For the patient, it is his or her head shaking that causes the wind to bend the tree. For the psychiatrist, such thinking is delusional. End quote. This could also occur in relation between sensory information from the body and the self-related functions of the brain. Northoff says that this is a bold claim at this point, but that this line of thinking could lead the direction of future research. He calls it the spatial-temporal approach to psychiatric disorders. I dig it.
Insights like this are exciting for the research of mental health, especially the ever-elusive schizophrenia. I won't stop until I understand that one. This episode is meant to be my first foray into neurophilosophy. Neurophilosophy, the neuropsychotherapy, like neuroexistentialism, and then the neurobiology of psychoanalysis. It feels like a niche. But no promises, this podcast is really just self-indulgent, and more about my personal curiosity than anything else. I am going to push back on one theme in Northoff's book. First of all, he speaks a bit disparagingly of my current academic crush and the matriarch of the domain, Patricia Churchland. Northoff almost mocks the early neurophilosophers and their refrain that the mind is the brain. But then he goes on to replace the mind-brain problem and the resulting hard problem of consciousness with what he calls the world-brain problem. But in bypassing the mind in relationship between the external world and the brain, he essentially echoes the very same refrain, that the mind is the brain. I also take issue with the word world. Surely there's a difference between the impact of external social stimuli, that is from other people, that occurs in the world, and then other sources of stimuli that come from the world, namely from nature or some other source. Take Northoff's example of the individual who believes that his head makes the trees shake. That person suffers no distress until societal forces in their life are unembracive of the connection that they've made in consciousness. I will modestly leave my critique at that. Thanks for hanging on this episode of Provisional Aspirations. Please leave a comment, hit that share button. I'd love to hear from you.